Good morning. Good morning. Today we're celebrating Valentine, I mean, Transfiguration Sunday, but it also is Valentine's Day. Happy Valentine's to everyone. We'll follow the order of service as printed and projected based on divine service setting two in our hymnal. Let's join in our opening hymn, Hail, O Source of Every Blessing. Gentiles now your grace possessing, in your courts obtain a place. Grateful now we fall before you, in your church rejoice to live. See your glory and adore you, thankful for the grace you give. Once far off, but now invited, we approach your sacred throne. In your covenant united, reconciled, redeemed, made one. Now revealed to Eastern sages, see the star of mercy shine. Mystery head in former ages, mystery great of love divine. Hail, O all inviting Savior, Gentiles now their offerings bring. In your temple seek your favor, Jesus Christ, our Lord and King. May we, body, soul, and spirit, live devoted to your praise. Glorious realms of bliss inherit, grateful anthems ever raise. I invite you to stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Let us then confess our sins to God, our Father. Almighty God in his mercy has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. 
He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Victory for our God. Alleluia. Sing with all the people of God and join in the hymn of all creation. Blessing and honor and glory and might be to God and the Lamb forever. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God, for the Lamb who was slain has begun his reign. Alleluia, alleluia. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O God, in the glorious transfiguration of your beloved Son, you confirmed the mysteries of the faith by the testimony of Moses and Elijah. In the voice that came from the bright cloud, you wonderfully foreshadowed our adoption by grace. Mercifully make us co-heirs with the King in his glory and bring us to the fullness of our inheritance in heaven. Through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated. Three readings this morning 
for the Sunday we observe as the transfiguration of our Lord, speak to either seeing or attesting to the glory of the Lord. Our first reading from 2 Kings chapter 2, where Elijah witnesses the glory of God in the chariots of fire. We begin in verse 1. Now when the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven by a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were on their way to Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me as far as Bethel. But Elisha said to, said to Elijah, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets who were in Bethel came out to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he said, Yes, I know. Keep silent. Elijah said to him, Elisha, please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to Jericho. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So they came to Jericho. The sons of the prophets who were at Jericho drew near to Elisha and said to him, Do you know that today the Lord will take away your master from over you? And he answered, Yes, I know it. Keep silent. Then Elijah said to Elisha, Please stay here, for the Lord has sent me to the Jordan. But he said, As the Lord lives, and as you yourself live, I will not leave you. So the two of them went on. Fifty men of the sons of the prophets also went and stood at some distance from them, as they both were standing by the Jordan. Then Elijah took his coat, cloak and rolled it up and struck the water. And the water was parted to the one side and to the other till the two of them could cross over on dry ground. When they had crossed, Elijah said to Elisha, Ask what I shall do for you before I am taken from you. And Elisha said, Please, let there be a double portion of your spirit on me. And Elijah said, You have asked a hard thing, yet if you see me as I am being taken from you, it shall be so for you. But if you do not see me, it shall not be so. And as they still went on and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it, and he cried, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw them no more. This is the word of the Lord. In our second reading, Paul is, Paul is speaking to the Corinthians, and in the verses preceding this reading, Paul speaks to the glory that came with the law that was engraved on stone. And then he speaks to the greater glory that comes, from, uh, comes with the new covenant of the gospel. So we read in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 12. Since we have such a hope, we are very bold, not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face so that the Israelites might not gaze at the outcome of what was being brought to an end. But their minds were hardened. For to this day, when they read the Old Covenant, that same veil remains unlifted because only through Christ is it taken away. Yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we all, with unveiled face below, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. 
Therefore, having this ministry, by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's word, but by the open statement of the truth, we would recommend, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, Let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. We stand for the Alleluia verse. shall we go you have the words of eternal life alleluia the holy gospel according to saint mark the ninth chapter After six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. And there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, and one for Moses, and one for Elijah. For he did not know what to say, for they were terrified. And a cloud overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, This is my beloved son, listen to him. And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. <clears throat> And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. This is the Gospel of the Lord. We sing our next hymn. You may be seated. clouds of glory, heaven's voice, the dazzling light. Moses and Elijah vanish, Christ alone commands the height. Peter, James, and John fall silent, turning from the summit's rise. Downward toward the shadowed valley Where their Lord has fixed his eyes Glimpsed and gone the revelation They shall gain and keep its truth Not by building on the mountain Any shrine or sacred booth but by following the Savior 
through the valley to the cross and by testing faith's resilience through betrayal, pain, and loss. Lord, transfigure our perception with the purest light that shines and recast our life's intentions to the shape of your designs till we seek Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text is the Holy Gospel appointed for today from Mark chapter 9, especially these words. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. And his clothes became radiant, intensely white, as no one on earth could bleach them. This is the text. I know my memory isn't as good as it used to be, but I don't recall ever a time when Transfiguration Sunday falls on Valentine's Day. Just can't remember it, probably has, but I just can't remember it that. And so that raises the question, well, is there a connection between Valentine's Day and Transfiguration Sunday. Well, Valentine's Day, of course, is all about love. We express our love for our sweethearts and tell them how much we appreciate them and uh, other loved ones. It's just a time to celebrate love and the loved ones that God has placed in our lives. Transfiguration is about transfiguration, but according to Scripture, and as most of us can attest, Love is the most transformative power in the world. Love can truly change people. Just as Jesus was transfigured on that mountain and shone with the light of heaven, God's love can truly transform people into something totally different from what they were. And that love is, of God is perhaps best expressed in 1 John chapter 4, Beginning at verse 7, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. And this is in this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he has loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. That is the transformative power of God's love. As John writes, God is love. That is, there's nothing we can do, nothing bad we can do, that would ever change his love for us, make him love us less. And there's nothing good that we can do that will make him love us more. He loves us because he is love. And so his love for us never changes. And to show that love, he sent his son into the world to be the propitiation for our sins, namely to pay for all of our sins by his death on the cross and resurrection. And then finally, since God has loved us in this way, we should be transformed. We should love one another. We are not the source of love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us. And because of his love for us, then we love one another. And many other places in scripture talk about the transformative power of love, namely God's love for us. One of my favorite books is a book written by Victor Hugo called Les Miserables. And it tells the story of the life of Jean Valjean and his life was transformed by love. He was thrown in prison because he stole a loaf of bread. 
He stole that loaf of bread because his sister's children were starving. So he, he stole that bread and to feed his sister's children. But he got caught and he got thrown in prison and he, he ended up trying to escape several times. And so his prison sentence kept being extended and extended. And uh, finally he got out though. He finally was released from prison. And in those days, this was in France in, 18, in the 1800s, there were no programs for ex-prisoners to help them out, to find a job, to find a place to live. And so Jean Valjean ended up destitute. He had nowhere to live, no food to eat, nowhere to go. But a pastor took him in, took him into his house and fed him and gave him a place to stay and a warm place and took care of him. And in response to that love that the, and kindness that the pastor showed to him, Jean Valjean got up in the middle of the night and stole all of the pastor's silver. The pastor had a big collection of silver dishes. He loaded them up in a bag, took off in the middle of the night. But he got caught. The police caught him and brought him back to the priest's house to verify that indeed what Jean Valjean had stolen was from the priest. When they got back to the priest's house, the pastor's house, they showed all the articles to the pastor and the pastor said, no, he didn't steal these. I gave him to them. I gave all of these to him. And then he said, but Jean Valjean, you forgot something. And he went over to his fireplace mantle and he took down two beautiful silver candlesticks and gave them to Jean Valjean and said, here, take all of these. And so the police left and the priest and the pastor said to Jean Valjean, now I've done you a great act of love. Now go forth and, and change your life. And Jean Valjean did. He took that silver that the, pre, the pastor had given or he had stolen from the priest and he sold it and he started a factory in a small town nearby. And that factory did very well. He became a very wealthy man. They even elected him mayor of the city. And then when he had the opportunity, he showed that love to someone else. There was an orphan girl that needed to be adopted who was just as destitute as he had been. And he adopted her and took care of her and transformed her life as well. And so in Jean Valjean, we see the power of God's love. The love that that pastor had shown for Jean Valjean is very similar to the love that God shows us. And it is two facets to it. So the pastor took care of Jean Valjean's uh, physical needs. He brought him into his house, gave him a place to stay, and fed him. And that is one way that God shows us his love. He takes care of our physical, everyday needs. But the other way that God shows us his love is by forgiving our sins. And the pastor did that as well. When Jean Valjean was caught stealing his property, he forgave him and let him have all those things and sent him off on his way, did not press charges at all. And that is the other aspect of God's love for us. He not only cares for our physical needs, but also for the sake of Christ, forgives all of our sins and uh, let, sets us free. Now, also in this book, there's another important character in the book. <clears throat> And that is a policeman by the name of Inspector Javert. And Inspector Javert does not believe that anyone can ever change. If you are a criminal, you're a criminal for life. There's no changing anyone. And so after Jean Valjean gets out of prison, this Inspector Javert keeps pursuing Jean Valjean, trying to rearrest him, get him back in prison. He knows he still needs to be back in prison. He's a once a criminal, always a criminal. And so uh, Inspector Javert is constantly pursuing him. He's just always a step behind. He just can never quite catch Jean Valjean. But then something really strange happens. Inspector Javert ends up getting taken as a prisoner by some revolutionaries. And they tie him up in a house. And Jean Valjean is put in charge of guarding this person, this policeman who's been pursuing him and hounding him his whole life long. He's in charge of guarding him to make sure he doesn't get away. And so what does Jean Valjean do? He sets him free. 
he lets Inspector Javert go free. Just unties him and lets him go free. Inspector Javert cannot handle that. He can't handle that gift of love that Jean Valjean had given him. And he, it causes him truly to lose his mind because he believes people cannot change. Everything must be done according to the law. There's right and there's wrong and nothing can ever change that. And so when someone shows him love and sets him free, he can't handle it. And he truly does lose his mind. So this story of Les Mis Miserables, to me, sums up the way that people respond to God's love. Because of his great love for us, God sent Jesus to die on the cross for our sins and set us free from all sin and from death and from the power of the devil. And some people believe that love and it transforms them. They look for opportunities to show that love to others. Just as Jesus was glowing on the Mount of Transfiguration, some people are glowing with the love of God because they know their sins are forgiven for Jesus' sake. But sadly, there are also other people that can't handle that kind of love. They are so caught up in the law and good works and right and wrong and how people can never change, that they cannot accept God's grace. And when they hear about it, it causes them to lose their mind. They just can't handle that kind of love. And they are like Inspector Javert. It literally causes them to lose their minds. I hope and pray that God's love has transformed you, that it has not destroyed your life, and I am sent by God to be like that pastor in the story of Les Miserables. I'm here to tell you that God does not wish to press charges against you for all of your many sins. For the sake of Christ, he wants you to go free. In addition to that, he's also provided for your daily physical needs, taking care of you from day to day, protecting you from danger, and providing for all you need for your body and life because of his love for you. And then to forgive you all your sins has sent his own dear son to pay for them all. And he wants you to know that love. And it wants, he wants that love to transform your life and wants you then to show that love to other people. Now there's one final aspect of the story of Les Miserables that I think is important. As I said, Jean Valjean took the silver that he had stolen or taken from the pastor, and he sold it and he used that money to start a factory, but he never sold the candlesticks, those silver candlesticks that the priest gave him and said, oh, you forgot these? He never sold those. He hung on to them. And so wherever he went, wherever he, when he was moving to a new place, he would take out those candlesticks and put them in a very prominent place in his house to remind him of the love that had been shown to him by that priest, by that pastor. And God has done the same for us. He has given us a constant reminder of his love through the sacrament of Holy Communion. He invites us to come and receive the body and blood of Jesus regularly to remind us of his transforming love so that we may never forget, just as those candlesticks served as a reminder to Jean Valjean of God's love for him. God gives us his sacrament of Holy Communion, the true body and blood of our Savior regularly, to remind us of his transforming love. So I wouldn't necessarily recommend celebrating Valentine's and Transfiguration every year together, but I do think there is a solid connection between Valentine's Day and Transfiguration. The love of God transforms us and makes us aglow with love for other people, the same love that God has given us. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. We join together in the Nicene Creed. I invite you to stand.
I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. In our special prayers today, we'll include a prayer for the family of Marion Wilkerson, who passed away last week. Marion was the mother of Linda Carlson. Let us pray. Almighty and most merciful God, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, we give thanks for all your goodness and tender mercy, especially for the gift of your dear Son, Implant your word in us that with good and honest hearts we may bring forth the fruits of faith. Lord, in your mercy. Rule and govern your church throughout the world. Bless those who proclaim your love that we may be preserved in the pure doctrine of your word and that faith in you may be strengthened, love toward others increased, and your kingdom extended. Lord, in your mercy. Grant health and prosperity to those in authority over us especially the President and Congress of the United States, the Governor and Legislature of Minnesota, and all those who make, administer, and judge our laws. Grant them grace to rule according to your good pleasure for the maintenance of righteousness and the hindrance and punishment of wickedness. Lord, in your mercy. Although we have deserved your righteous wrath and punishment, yet we ask you, O merciful Father, not to remember the sins of our youth nor our many transgressions. Out of your unspeakable love and goodness, defend us from all harm and danger to body and soul. Preserve us from false doctrine, from war and bloodshed, from epidemics and pestilence, and from all calamity by fire and water, from hail and tempest, from famine and anguish of heart. Lord, in your mercy. Cause the needed fruits of the earth to prosper, that we may enjoy them in due season. Give success to the Christian training of the young, and to all lawful occupations on land, sea, and air, crowning them with your blessing. Lord, in your mercy. Receive, O God, our bodies and souls, our talents and powers, together with the offerings we bring before you today. For by his precious blood, your Son has purchased us to be his own, that we may live under him in his kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. Grant your Holy Spirit to those who come to the Lord's table this day, that they may receive the body and blood of Jesus in sincere repentance and firm faith, and to their abundant blessing. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you are the maker of heaven and earth and giver of life. We thank you for all the blessings you granted to Marian Wilkerson during her earthly life, especially for calling her to faith in Jesus. Comfort those who mourn her death with the hope of the glorious resurrection and a joyful reunion in heaven. Help us remember that we are mortal so that we will always be prepared to fall asleep in faith and so receive the glory promised to all who trust in Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. These and whatsoever other things you would have us ask of you, O God, grant us for the sake of Jesus Christ, your only Son, our Lord and Savior, 
who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. As noted in the bulletin, if you have not already done so, we invite you to place your offering in the offering plates on the table in the narthex. We join together in singing the offertory. You may be seated. Crete, I render to the Lord for all his benefits to me. Sacrifice of thanksgiving, and will call on the name of the Lord. I will take the cup of salvation, and will call on the name of the Lord. courts of the Lord's house, in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. The service of the sacrament, I invite you to stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who at his transfiguration revealed his glory to his disciples that they might be strengthened to proclaim his cross and resurrection, and with all the faithful look forward to the glory of life everlasting. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it 
in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
I invite you to stand. The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. We join in the post-communion canticle. Thank the Lord and sing his praise. Tell everyone what he has done. Let everyone who seeks the Lord rejoice and proudly bear his name. He recalls his promises and leads his people forth in joy with shouts of thanks giving. Alleluia, Alleluia. Let us pray. O God the Father, the fountain and source of all goodness, who in loving kindness sent your only begotten Son into the flesh, we thank you that for his sake you have given us pardon and peace in this sacrament, and we ask you not to forsake your children, but always to rule our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that we may be enabled constantly to serve you. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. now been sown, thy blessing, Lord, bestow. The power is thine alone to make it sprout and grow. Do thou in grace the harvest raise, and thou alone shalt have the praise. To thee our wants are known, from thee are all our powers. Accept what is thine own, and pardon what is ours. Our praises, Lord, and prayers receive, and to thy word a blessing give. O oh, grant that each of us now met before thee here may meet together thus when thou and thine appear and follow thee to heaven our home means so amen lord jesus come please be seated you would think i could remember so what was it uh, somebody was telling me? It's When it's this cold out, it's actually 53 degrees warmer in your refrigerator than it is outside today. 53 degrees warmer in your refrigerator. So if you want to warm up, uh, no, wouldn't recommend crawling in there. But yeah, we love this, don't we? 
All right. Well, since this is Transfiguration Sunday, that means Wednesday is Ash Wednesday. We'll start with our midweek Lenten services. And the time has changed. In the past, we've met at 6.30. This year, we're having our Lenten services at 5.30. And so this Wednesday, Ash Wednesday, our first Lenten service will be at 5.30. And uh, continue then till uh, the end of March, each Wednesday. The theme of our midweek services this year is at the foot of the cross. As it says in the bulletin, the, the main event, of course, was Jesus dying for us on the cross. But, but the Bible tells us all these other things that were going on while Jesus was dying on the cross. It happened right there at the foot of the cross. And so that will be the focus of the Le midweek Lenten services, those things Scripture tells us that were going on while Jesus was dying for us on the cross. And it's quite a transition to go from today, which is Transfiguration Sunday. We see the glory of Jesus. We see that there's no doubt he's God in human flesh, glowing as bright as the sun. And then to move into the season of Lent, where he's tempted, he suffers, he dies. And it's the same person on that Mount of Transfiguration as the one that we will follow to the cross during the season of Lent.